thank you everyone for joining us at the Project Censored radio show. We're very glad right now to be joined by Dr. Gerald Horn, who holds the Moore's Professorship of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. His research addresses issues of racism in a variety of relations involving labor, politics, civil rights, international relations, and war. Dr. Horn is the author of more than 30 books and 100 scholarly articles and reviews. His current research includes two forthcoming books, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of U.S. Fascism, and Revolting Capital, Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1918 to 1968. Dr. Horn, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm happy to report that both of those books have been published. Oh, fantastic. Well, then, folks, you can add that to the, the long list of books by Dr. Horn to check out. Um, so, Dr. Horn, I want to I know that we're recording this and obviously airing it uh, after July 4th, but I want to turn the clock back rough some 250 years ago um, at the founding of the United States, as you put it, as an apartheid nation um, that you mentioned in your book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776. And now we're taught in this country, but I can also say as somebody who grew up in Europe, uh, that we're also taught that the American Revolution was a huge step forwards for egalitarian ideals. Um, now, anybody who does even a little bit of research will find out things like, for instance, at the founding of the nation, only 6% of the population was allowed to vote. That's white property owning men. Um, so that immediately demotes that pedestaled revolution um, from the heights uh, and the, that it's placed. But there's more to it than that. Um, and as you note, uh, the Africans living in what was then the the, the American colonies uh, were used as threats against colonists, i.e. will arm enslaved Africans and use them against, uh, against you. And so Africans overwhelmingly sided with the British in the war, um, a Britain where by 1774, some 10 to 15,000 slaves had gained freedom but this freedom did not apply in the British colonies. Uh, now, Dr. Horn, I'm wondering how much did this, these abolitionist threats uh, and what the colonists were, uh, were, were getting from the crown weigh in the ultimate push for that quote unquote, you know, revolutionary war? Well, I, thought, I think it was significant uh, as I point out um, in my book and as has been validated by other researchers and scholars, in order to understand 1776, you have to understand 1772, that is to say Somerset's case, where the settlers led by George Washington had reason to believe that England was moving to abolish slavery in England itself, and that was thought to hold jeopardy for major fortunes based upon enslaved Africans in the colonies. But it's not only that question, uh, keep in mind as well, that 1762, 1763, you have the so-called Royal Proclamation, whereby London cast doubt upon continuing to expend blood and treasure, a waging war against the indigenous nations in order that real estate speculators like George Washington uh, could profit. And that too was outrageous to many of the settlers and as validated by subsequent events, we know that after the triumph of the so-called patriots, they precisely began to steamroller through the rest of the continent, uh, which helps to explain during round two of the battle for North America, why Tecumseh, the great uh, Native American leader who was seeking to organize a so-called pan-Indian confederation, uh, fought shoulder to shoulder uh, with the Redcoats against the settlers. That's why in August 1814, when the Redcoats invaded Washington, D.C. and torched it, they were joined by a countless number of Black people who, of course, were laboring under enslavement and then fled on British boats to Trinidad and Tobago, where their descendants continued to reside. Now, uh, I think that many of our friends on the left, they would like to see all of us on the same page. And therefore, they tend to gloss over the fact, which you introdu introduced in your opening remarks, that obviously all of us were not on the same page. But I understand the sentiment. And, and what is more difficult to understand is why the formation of the United States could be seen as a great leap forward for numerous Europeans, uh, after all, uh, 
Uh, you had uh, religious dissidents, Catholics, and those who were Jewish in the first instance who were persecuted on the shores of Europe. But once they crossed the Atlantic, they were redefined in this identity politics of whiteness and then did not face as much persecution on these shores as they did in Europe. Although to be fair, uh, they did not escape persecution altogether. There were torching of convents uh, in the United States uh, post-1776, reflecting the what one historian called the Protestant Crusade. And of course, uh, many Jewish people uh, continued to be persecuted on, on these shores despite the promise of, of the First Amendment. And so it's well past time for a reevaluation of 1776. I say this in particular, uh, since we're facing the prospect of what an many analysts consider to be an onslaught of fascism or neo-fascism. And the history that we're taught today, it seems to me, was very helpful in helping to undergird the movement against Jim Crow in the 1960s. But that was more than 50 or 60 years ago. And we all know that, that history changes. That helps to explain why W.E.B. Du Bois, the founder of the NAACP, the great Pan-Africanist, uh, helped to change our perception of reconstruction in the United States, the post US Civil War period, which to the point that W.E.B. Du Bois published his book, Black Reconstruction, was portrayed as an era of Negro corruption and cupidity. But after his book, it was portrayed as an era of democratic promise. And that is the prevailing interpretation today. And so we need a new interpretation of the founding of the United States that helps to shed light once again on why we may be on the verge of a unique and peculiar form of fascism. Yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to touch on something that you mentioned uh, briefly, because I think that's also part of uh, part of the problem with how we learn history. It's very uh, it, it's very much siloed, you know, OK, like the enslaved Africans were here and the indigenous were here. But you made the point there was a lot of crossover there. And uh, as, as as folks have written in, in a variety of books, like the indigenous pe uh, people's history of the United States, for instance, uh, runaway slaves would sometimes find their way and be welcomed into indigenous communities. How much is that? Uh, how much do you feel that 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 solidarity and that potential was also a threat to the settlers uh, around that the, the time of the Revolutionary War? Well, that is one of the more unspoken chapters in the history of the United States. Although uh, I would salute your reference to the indigenous people's history in the United States, because it's one of the few texts that actually uh, addresses that issue. In the book I mentioned at the top of our discussion, my book on Texas, I talk about the relationship between the Caddo people, C-A-D-D-O, on the Texas-Louisiana border, who basically had an interlocking directorate with black people. One of the major threats to US seizure of Florida, approximately 200 years ago, was the fact that the people we refer to as the Seminoles, who by the way, rather disgustingly, that is the nickname used by the athletic teams of Florida State University in Tallahassee, that's another story for another day. But in any case, the, the Seminoles likewise had an, an interlocking directorate with black people. In fact, uh, there were those on the scene in the 18 teens who suggested that actually the Seminoles were a black led indigenous formation. And certainly they wanted nothing to do with the United States of America because the United States of America had a well-merited reputation of exacting a genocide against the indigenous and enslaving Africans wherever they could be found. What I find interesting about Native American history in retrospect is that those who sought to accommodate the settlers, I'm speaking of the Cherokee, who once occupied in profusion the Southeast quadrant of North America, uh, they, many of them converted to Christianity, many of them became sedentary agriculturalists, many of them actually enslaved Africans in order to accommodate themselves to the settlers. Many of them occupied mansions, but they had to go oftentimes their mansions were then occupied by Europeans fresh off the boat, which, by the way, helps us to understand why it's been so difficult to revise 
the interpretation, the traditional interpretation of the United States, because many Europeans did benefit and profit from crossing the Atlantic. So those indigenous who accommodated themselves to the settlers oftentimes got it in the neck. And then those indigenous who fought, I'm speaking of the Comanches in the first place, some of the most fierce fighters uh, in North America, the Lords of the Plains, particularly in the Texas, Oklahoma region, uh, they too were subjected to genocide. So it was very difficult to put it mildly for Native Americans to survive in the face of this settler onslaught and perhaps to make an excuse for many of the his histories that have been written since, perhaps one of the reasons why it's been so difficult to grapple with Native American history is because so many of them have been disappeared. And so therefore it becomes easier uh, to ignore their previous existence. Obviously the presence of enslaved Africans, such as my ancestors, uh, makes it difficult uh, to ignore our, our history, our presence, uh, because you have to be able to understand why so many Black people are walking through the streets of North America. Uh, how did we get here? How did we survive? And those questions, I'm happy to say, have captivated a newer generation of historians. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I, I am curious because you've mentioned uh, in, in a couple of different contexts, religion and, you know, the, 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 the United States then being a place to escape to in, in terms of religion. I'm also curious with that, the question of slavery, it seems like some of the cases that were happening in Britain where they were asking, oh, well, sh should this be allowed, were because these uh these former slaves had then been baptized and so oh well we can't we we, we have to recognize their freedom now what did did, did did that play a role in the question also in the united states i know that that the role of religion was also used to keep them enslaved because the bible has slavery in it but was there this question of like well if they're baptized then was there a role for religion there as well religion is one of the most important factors in seeking to explain the history of the United States of America. Religion is an important factor in terms of the fundamental question of why it is in this hemisphere, the Protestants prevailed in what is now the United States of America, a stretching north into Canada, but south of the United States, uh, you see countless numbers of Spanish speakers, of Spanish, Portuguese, and French ancestry. And in order to understand that, uh, you may want to consult my book on the 16th century, because what basically happens is that the rise of Martin Luther, 1517, and the Protestant secession from the Catholic Church happens simultaneous with the European invasion of the Americas. Protestantism, as we well know, uh, then sweeps through England in the 1530s. It helps to generate countless conflict between English Protestants and Irish Catholics and Scottish Catholics. At the same time, England is trying to emulate the Iberian powers, Spain and Portugal, in setting up settlements in North America. Now, Spain in particular had a religious qualification for settlement. That is to say, officially, in order to settle Spanish Florida, which they occupied in 1565, you had to be Catholic. London, the Protestant power, the scrappy underdog, uh, moved in a different direction. Uh, that is to say that it did not mandate a religious qualification for settlement. If you look at the history of Maryland and Baltimore, for example, there are English Catholics, Lord Baltimore, uh, who settled uh, that particular region beginning in the first few decades of the 17th century. And so what you see is that that leads to a certain kind of reconciliation between English Protestants and Irish Catholics and Scottish Catholics as they join hands in a new identity politics of whiteness, which then morphs into white supremacy and ultimately allows those who had been warring on the shores of Europe, not only English versus Irish and English versus Scots, but British versus German and German versus Pole and Pole versus Russian and Northern Italian versus Southern Italian and Serb versus Croat. All of a sudden, when they cross the Atlantic, they adopt this new identity 
of whiteness, which morphs into white supremacy, which is something uh, that is still, I'm afraid to say, endemic uh, on these shores. And that also helps to explain uh, why the Protestants in the first instance were able to prevail in North America, or at least in what is now in the United States and Canada, but not necessarily South of the US uh, border. Now, with regard to the, the enslaved, it, it was something of a false promise <laughs> to the enslaved. Uh, that is to say, initially the idea was these Africans were being enslaved uh, because they were pagans, so-called, because they were non-Christians. And so one would think that after they were converted or did convert, that somehow that would be an escape hatch allowing him to escape enslavement. But no, 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 it was a false promise. And so uh, you still see uh, that a disproportionate number of uh, black people in the United States uh, are Protestants, but because of the inadequate teaching of history in this country, many of them oftentimes are unaware of why they are Protestants, given the fact that Governor DeSantis of Florida is making a big to do about what he calls woke history, which translated means accurate history. Uh, it's doubtful if uh, many of these uh, black people or any people for that matter will be enlightened. He's been won up by Mr. Trump, who in the waning days of his administration appointed a so-called 1776 commission to make sure that more accurate and adequate interpretations of the history of this country would not emerge. And of course, uh, the United States is uh, facing its 250th anniversary in 2026. And already uh, there are signs and glimmerings that this will not be an occasion for the emergence of a more accurate history, particularly once again, if you look at Virginia where Governor Youngkin, a former Titan of Wall Street is able to become elected governor of the Cavalier State, speaking of Virginia, on the premise that he's campaigning against so-called critical race theory, he's campaigning against so-called woke history, uh, any kind of history that makes uh, little Johnny and little Jennifer supposedly feel bad about themselves. That, that includes uh, reading the novels of Toni Morrison, the late Nobel laureate. So I think your audience should understand that history is about an accurate and adequate interpretation of the past, but as my invoking of these elected officials and politicians tends to suggest, it's also about the present and also about shaping what kind of future we're going to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm reminded of the James Baldwin quote, although I might be butchering it, the history is not past. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of curious because you talking about current politics made me think of this, that, you know, in the U.S., we're very much stuck in a binary like, oh, well, if you're not for the Democrat, you must be for the Republican. Uh, and so I'm wondering in this in this read or in, in this diving into U.S. history and this deconstructing it, is there is there a um, uh, a worry that you might make that we might see that students might see Great Britain as like a really benevolent power <laughs> like oh well the revolutionary war was bad but see britain was trying to abolish slavery and they didn't want to get into the indigenous lands in the west so they're the good guys like uh, do you do you find people trying to latch on to that as like uh, as an alternative uh, to 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 the 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 revolutionary war as a positive well i think what you're pointing up is that history is complicated it's not a simple tale of good guys and bad guys if you look at world war ii the united states was allied with the soviet union that's the way it was able to prevail against nazi germany uh, i pointed out on a previous book that it was president roosevelt himself that encouraged warner brothers to produce the movie mission to moscow which you can find online which portrays uh, mr stalin now viewed widely in the United States as a tin pot dictator, as a benevolent leader, uh, much beloved uh, by his people. And so the United States is not necessarily innocent when it comes to revising interpretations. And with regard to Britain, the fact of the matter is that just like the United States uh, owes a debt of gratitude to the Soviet Union for help to helping to defeat Nazi Germany, 
the fact of the matter is, is that Britain was more advanced in the United States uh, on the question of enslavement, which is not to say <laughs> that it was a progressive nation, which is not to say that it was the savior of humanity. It is to say, speaking factually, that Britain abolished the slave trade before the United States in 1807. The British abolished slavery in Jamaica, Barbados, et cetera. In the 1830s, uh, the United States had to wait for a civil war, a bloody civil war, in order to reluctantly abolish slavery. Those are just the facts. Now, I know U.S. patriots, uh, they tried to twist that, and make you seem, make it seem as if you're an apologist for London. But uh, it reminds me of uh, what the comedian uh, Stephen Colbert once said, that uh, progressive politics oftentimes uh, has a bias, for example. That is to say that seeking to, to tell an accurate story uh, can get you painted as an apologist. But I, I think it's time for the U.S. patriots to, to, to wake up and, and realize that uh, the United States was not necessarily seen by Black people in particular as, as some sort of savior, although that's what we're supposed to believe in school. And, and once again, turn to Canada, for example. Now, when I juxtapose Canada and the United States, uh, uh, I open myself up for attacks from the left with regard to Canada's uh, maltreatment of the indigenous. But the fact of the matter is that Canada is a control group, as the social scientists might say. It did not rebel against London's rule. And yet, uh, Toronto just elected a socialist mayor a few days ago. Canada has the single payer health care system for, health, uh, for medical care that we can only dream about in this country. And folks should draw some inferences from that juxtaposition. And uh, as long as you uh, style yourself as some sort of a blind, unseeing patriot devoted to the United States, defending it uh, from the right, defending it from the left, I, I don't think that we'll be able to dig ourselves out of the deep hole in which we find ourselves, which once again has us barreling down the track towards the neo-fascism. Absolutely. And I don't honestly know how you can defend the U.S. from the left. <laughs> <laughs> um, and kind of, kind of like uh, wrapping up here, I'm curious, this is, uh, I suppose, a bit more of a philosophical question, but uh, I, I mean, even just particularly recently, as we saw with the affirmative action case and uh, having read Justice Jackson's dissenting opinion, uh, she did a what I felt was a pretty good job of condensing some of the 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 history of affirmative action, as she puts it, in maintaining the role of white people, um, and as I would say, like white supremacy, quite clearly. And so the question is, if the foundation of the country in this case is rotten, an apartheid state uh, based on slavery and genocide, and the history leading up to the present has failed um, to, to rectify that original horror, do you see a future for rach racial equality in the United States? Well, absolutely. And since this is being taped, uh, insert after my comment about Stephen Colbert, where he said that reality has a progressive bias. And that's the point that I was trying to make, that when you try to paint a realistic picture, uh, it inevitably, I would hope, leads you towards a progressive interpretation. Now, with regard to Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's dissenting opinion in the affirmative action case, uh, I recommend that your audience peruse that opinion because she zeroes in not only on what you mentioned, which is that United States history up to this point has been a massive program of affirmative action for the settlers. They were the ones who benefited, benefited from, in the first instance, from seizing the land of the indigenous population, particularly after the passage of the home, so-called Homestead Act in the 1860s. Recall what I said about mansions of the Cherokees and the Southeast Quadrant of North America, which were turned over in mass to settlers of European descent. Uh, the Columbia University political scientist, Ira Katz Nelson wrote a book called When Affirmative Action Was White, for example. And then under immense pressure, both globally and domestically, you have these halting and tentative steps toward a new kind of affirmative action, uh, 
uh, which the Supreme Court has wounded severely. However, as Justice Brown Jackson pointed out uh, in her opinion, there's a footnote in Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, majority opinion, that has a carve out to continue affirmative action for military academies, for West Point, for the US Naval Academy, for the US Air Force uh, Academy in Colorado Springs, presumably for the Citadel in South Carolina, Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia, uh, in light of the fact that as we speak, the leading uniformed and civilian leaders of the US military are both of African ancestry, speaking of Lloyd Austin, Pentagon chief, Siku Brown, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So as Justice Brown Jackson said, uh, the United States, uh, per this opinion, is saying that it's okay to integrate black people and other people of color into the bunker, but not the boardroom. I would say it's suggesting that we can still be conscripted to defend the empire as we have been forced to do in all of these countless wars over the decades of Vietnam, not least, where for the longest period of time, Black mortality rates were much higher than non-Black mortality rates. And that's sending a very uh, disturbing signal, to put it mildly, and I should also say that understandably, there's this focus on Black people when it comes to affirmative action. But as a number of studies have shown, perhaps the leading recipient of this positive discrimination, to use the term from London, uh, would be women of European descent. And then the question becomes, is that on the chopping block as well? Uh, will programs, as they sought to have in California, to have corporations that do business in California uh, have a complement of women on the board. Is that now on the chopping block, uh, for example, attempts to recruit women into STEM fields, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Is that on the chopping block right now? I think that a Pandora's box has been opened and understandably now the progressive movement is going after legacy admissions, which is a lingering aspect of affirmative action for wealthy white families. This is the program whereby if your grandparents and parents attended Harvard, you get affirmative action points, for example, that boost you over those whose parents and grandparents did not attend Harvard. That is still intact. We'll, it'll be interesting to see uh, what the Supreme Court does if, if and when that comes before them. But I think that the message should be clear particularly to communities of color, particularly to black people in particular, that if you look at our history, uh, one of the ways we've been able to advance is not only through domestic alliances, it's been through international alliances. That's the import of the Haitian Revolution and its impact on slavery, the Haitian Revolution 1791 to 1804, uh, which has enormous impact on these shores. Uh, that's the impact of the coming to independence of African and Caribbean nations, simultaneously and not coincidentally with the rise of the civil rights movement because they were joined and interlocked. And that's the lesson that's precisely been lost in 2023, which is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons we've been enduring and suffering so many setbacks. And so do you, I, I guess like, do you feel that as an institution, as a, as a nation state of the United States, is racial equality, could Black folks, could the descendants of the enslaved on these shores ever experience full citizenship in a country like the United States? Well, I'm glad you asked that question again, because I, I didn't respond directly uh, when you first posed it. My simple answer is yes, but obviously uh, I can be accused, uh, perhaps understandably, of being a naive for saying that in light of my previous remarks about barreling down the tracks towards you know, fascism, I could be accused of, as the lawyer is saying, pleading inconsistent counts. That is to say, uh, your honor, my client didn't do it and he won't do it again. But uh, as a person who studied history, as a person who has written about the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, uh, I don't have a Whiggish view of constant progress, but I have seen 
the erosion of the slave trade, the erosion of slavery, the erosion of US apartheid. And I think that part of getting us to the goal line of the kind of equality that's implicated in your question is rethinking how we got to this point and particularly stressing international alliances. That's the way historically we've been able to circumvent and do an end run around this right wing hegemony that obtains amongst too many in this country. And so I guess I would revise my remarks to say, yes, I do think the kind of equality that you suggest is possible, but it will involve a rejiggering, a recalibration, a recalculation of the kinds of strategies and tactics we pursue to this point. Yes, absolutely. I have a, a shift away from fascism, clearly. <laughs> well, to begin with. <laughs> yes, at the very least. Um, Dr. Horn, thank you so much for taking the time. Where can folks uh, find your work? Well, m m most of my books are still in print, and they're easily and readily available thus far. But given the trend towards book bans, who, who knows how long that'll last? Uh, as of now, uh, I have a, a number of Facebook pages that are devoted to my work, and this talk will probably wind up uh, on that Facebook page. And then I have YouTube lectures, which thus far can still be accessed, but once again, uh, who knows what the future may bring. Yes, well, as as Project Censored, we are we are uh, unfortunately well acquainted with censorship. So, uh, <laughs> if you can't find Dr. Horn's books easily, then it's worth digging uh, because if they're going to ban them, then then they're worth reading. Uh, Dr. Horn, thank you again for joining us at the project. Thank you for inviting me.